Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us from across the country today for the Seed Economics webinar. Um, we are excited to have such a great turnout. We had uh, over 50 registrants, which is a record for us. Um, we're going to give people a few more minutes to join because we're just hitting uh, the start time now. So if you've just joined us, you'll see that there is a poll. And thank you, everyone, who's filled it out so far. We just wanted to get a little bit more information about who's participating today and what, what you're interested in. So it's really great to see that we have people from across the country, um, different levels of experience, and lots of people who are interested, interested in both uh, contracts and enterprise budgets. Um, for everybody, if you would like to open your chat window, this would be a great way for us to communicate during the webinar. Um, we will have the participants muted, and uh, Chris Thoreau and myself, Shauna McKinnon, will be leading the presentations today. And so you're going to see this, our screen shared, and we won't be using the video options today. So all you need is to be able to view the presentation and then have your chat box open. Um, we will have uh, two breaks for questions as we go through. And during those question breaks, um, you can use the chat box, ask questions, or you can use the raise your hand feature, and then we can unmute you so you can ask your questions directly. So while we're waiting for, the, um, for a few more people to join, I'll just give a, a quick welcome. So uh, Chris Throw and myself, Shauna McKinnon, um, we both work for Farm Folk City Folk on the BC Seed Security Program which is also part of the Bata Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security. And um, the seed program is really focused on um, increasing the quality, quantity, and diversity of ecological seeds grown locally. So what we're going to be focusing on today are um, some of the economic research and resources that we have been putting together. And I'm gonna wait a few more minutes um, to jump right into the presentation. In the meantime, if you still have your poll and you've already filled it out, um, you can minimize that window and, um, or close it out. I'm, I am going to keep it open a little while longer for people who join um, during the start of the call. And if anyone has any technical issues, uh, this would be a great time to let us know just so we can guide you through finding the chat window or um, testing your sound. But it looks, from the looks of things, it looks like everyone has things set up well. So let me know if you have any questions. And in just two minutes, we'll get started with the presentation. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to get started. So welcome, everyone. And so as I mentioned, uh, there's two parts to the presentation. The first one, we're going to go over growing seed on contract. And then the second part of the presentation will be on enterprise budgets, which Chris will be presenting. And in between both of those pres presentations, we'll have a break for questions. As we're going through the presentations, if you have a question, feel free to um, type it into the chat box, and we will um, get to it during the question period. So I'll just start with a little bit of context. Um, for the BC Seed Program, one of our main research projects and really a core of our work is the BC Seed Trials, which is collaborative research in partnership with UBC Farm um, and the Center for Sustainable Food Systems. And these are vegetable variety trials that are focused on crops that are well suited for BC seed production. As part of this um, research, we're not only trialing vegetable varieties, but we're also looking for opportunities to train farmers, and also um, developing economic tools that can support farmers to increase, um, to increase their seed, the scale of their seed production. So this economic research and resources that we're going to present today are 
um, one of the supporting pieces of the BCC trials. So I'm going to start with um, a, a step um, taking a, the, the big picture look um, that economic research is, um, is a part of. The majority of seeds, um, <laughs> so sorry, I'll just, I just need to uh, minimize some of my, here we go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. Um, just reducing the amount of pop-up boxes I have with the webinar <laughs> software. Okay. <clears throat> so just taking a step back on the seed market in general. So in Canada, um, there is already a large market for organic and ecologic ecologically grown vegetable seeds. Uh, $28 million of seeds um, is estimated to be sold in 2014, and that number is steadily growing. Um, about 25% of that seed is, is purchased by BC farmers and BC um, gardeners. So we already know that there is a substantial market for this seed in Canada. Um, never mind the amount of seeds um, that is being consumed in North America. So knowing that there is this, this large seed market and much of the seed that's being used by commercial scale growers is imported um, either through purchasing directly from USC companies or from um, purchasing seed from Canadian companies who source a lot of their seeds internationally. Um, when we're looking at the question of supporting farmers to scale up their seed production, one of the questions we had was, if they scale up, where will they sell the seed? And can they make a decent return on that? So those were the questions that really drove our research in this area. So the, um, the contract research is really better understanding what are the opportunities for Canadian seed growers to grow seed on contract as a way to scale up their seed production. Um, the seed enterprise budget research is really looking at answering the question of can you make a decent return and what are the economics, what do they really look like? And we found that in our work, working with farmers, these were questions that people didn't have easy answers to. There wasn't a lot of existing information. So we really wanted to fill this gap of finding out what are the real numbers and, and what are the, the actual opportunities. So on the contract research, the first thing that I did was speak with um, leading seed companies that are focused on organic and ecological seed. So on this slide here, you can see the companies that, that I've been speaking to, um, doing interviews and better understanding what the contract opportunities are with these companies, and also better understanding how they start relationships with new contract growers, what the requirements are, what um, types of testing and quality assurance um, practices need to be followed, all those types of questions. and so. From this research, um, I've put together a suite of resources that I will be um, presenting to you today, and we have them also available online. So th the good news is that once we started looking into the opportunities for contract growing, um, we received a very, very um, consistent and clear confirmation from the companies that we talked to that there is a real opportunity here, um, that there is a need for more organic and ecologically produced seeds, and there are lots of opportunities for Canadian growers to, feel, to fill that niche. Um, two examples here, so Dan Jason from Salt Springs Seeds, who probably many of you know, Dan Jason has been um, growing and selling seed through Salt Springs Seeds for 40 years. And from his estimation and his long experience working in ecological seed sector, um, he says that now, Currently, like in the last number of years, there has been more interest in local seed than ever before, and he sees his sales increasing significantly. And he sees a, lot, a big gap, actually, not just for people um, growing seed on contract and, um, and selling them to existing seed companies, but also an opportunity for people to start their own seed companies. Um, his estimation is that there is a lot of room in the market. Uh, Dan Brees Bra from Turnacell Farm in Quebec was another person who we interviewed for this research. Um, and many people might be familiar with Turnacell Farm. Um, Dan is a cooperative farm that does market vegetable production. And then Dan has been leading um, the seed production part of their farm. And he actually started as a contract grower contracting um, to other regional seed companies across Canada. And then 
also developed his own seed packet company. And even though he has his own seed packing company, he is still doing some contract brewing for larger seed companies. And he, um, growing seed on contract is something that he has been encouraging other seed companies or other new seed growers to look into doing um, because he is quite confident that there is an economically viable um, case for growing seed on contract and that this is a way that farmers could increase the seed production on their farm and um, make a profit farming. The opportunities, um, there are opportunities for both beginner and advanced growers and these opportunities are different. So if you're a beginner seed grower um, and you're just getting started and just starting to develop relationships with companies, you're going to be starting with some of the smaller and local seed companies. And the crops that you would be producing are ones that are probably lower value crops, um, but there is still a need for. So crops with high space um, needs, things like peas and beans, um, also crops with lot, large isolation distances, so things like squashes. Uh, these are the types of seed crops that small and regional seed companies always need. Um, and they like to use these as an entry point for new growers because um, the relationship is really important to develop over time. So they don't want to start you with the most challenging seed crop. They want to start beginner growers with some of these easier ones. And then as they, as you gain expertise and as they better understand um, where your skills are and what crops you could grow, they can move you up into some of the more advanced crops. If you already are um, an established seed grower or have a lot of seed growing experience, um, there are opportunities in some of the higher value crops. So this research, we really began the research focusing on BC and what works well for BC growers. So we spent quite a bit of time talking about the crops that have a climate advantage in BC. So this is really biennials, beets, carrots, spinach. Um, there is a huge market needs for these across the country. Um, but there's also opportunities, similar opportunities for other regions of Canada. We just didn't explore them in our initial research. Um, the reason why biennials are trickier to grow and it didn't really matter the scale of the company, even some of the larger ecological seed companies, biennials are something that, that they consistently need and consistently are looking for new growers. Also, there is, um, it was repeated again and again that high performing open pollinated varieties were a big gap in the marketplace in general for, for, um, for seed. So even from some of the bigger companies, um, they know that, that larger seed producers are not focusing on maintaining high-performing OPs, which means that for smaller seed growers or people that are newly getting into this, there is a niche to be filled um, and having um, a reputation for being able to deliver high-performing open pollinated varieties. A certified organic seed is also, not surprisingly, um, a really important part of the marketplace that's growing substantially. So uh, many of you are likely organic growers, so are familiar with, with the process that, um, that takes place for organic certification and, and how seed is looked at. So if organic seed variety is available, then that is what needs to be chosen by organic growers. So as more certified organic seed becomes available, the market for it actually increases. And for many seed companies, they see that they, um, that they need actually more certified organic growers and that there's still a lot, of, um, a lot of crops and varieties where there's an undersupply in organic seeds. So for example, um, things like certified organic flower seed or certified organic herbs, there are some, some important market opportunities here because there just isn't enough supply right now. And as that supply becomes available, there is a ready market because a lot of um, market certified organic market vegetable growers are adding more flowers to their farm. So they need to choose certified organic seed if it is available. Um, another important consideration around certified organic seed is that for growers that are already certified organic for regional certification, so like BC certified organic or being certified organic in Quebec, this could be a time where it would be valuable to have a national certification. And there may be a little bit more expense involved, but by having national organic certification, then you would be able to contract with certified organic seed companies in other regions of Canada. 
of which there are a number of them. And again, because of the different climatic advantage for different types of seed in different regions in Canada, um, there is an opportunity to be able to grow seed suited to your region and then sell it to different regions in Canada. And having that um, Canadian organic certification would enable you to do that. Similarly, if you want to um, sell seeds outside of Canada um, to some of the US ecologically, uh, ecologically focused seed companies, um, having Canadian organic certification uh, is a must. So I really want to emphasize that, that um, certified organic seed is an underserved, underserved market and there's definitely a need for more, more seed to be produced. And again, it's also the higher value market. So having organic certification can be really worthwhile. Um, the other very clear message from speaking with all of the seed companies is that re reliability um, and quality are the most important parts of starting a relationship with a new seed grower. Um, and that is why they often start with some of the lower value or more easily replaceable um, crops if they're just starting a relationship with a new grower. So understanding what is required for um, for quality assurance and the best management practices for seed production is really important. Um, as part of the resources that we've put together for growing seed on contracts, um, you can see the URL there um, on the slides. And we've done a summary of what the, what the main protocols and practices are for quality assurance, um, linked to Canadian regulations so you can understand um, what, what the regulations are for, for germination tests and um, and how to label seed, those types of things. It's really important whether, uh, whether a company requires, um, requires you to follow all of those protocols um, it's, or having um, government certification, it's still really essential to understand um, what, what the regulations are and, and the ins and outs of all of those protocols. Um, also, communication is, is a big key and um, when we talk more about um, some of the expectations around what the companies are asking for for quality assurance, communication is, is fundamental and for agreeing upon how you will communicate how things are going throughout the season and what you will do when problems arise. Um, one of the other resources that we've put together for this research are case studies um, from companies that purchase seed from, from contract growers. So I've already mentioned um, both of these cases. So Dan Brisebra from Turnacell Farm from Quebec, um, who again started as a contract grower, then developed a seed packet company and is still doing contract growing. So um, his case study really gives a sense of how um, a new seed grower can develop their business over time and also gives insight into what the expectations are from their company in terms of how they work with their contract growers and, and where the responsibilities lie. Um, Dan Jason from Salt Spring Seeds has a network of con contract growers that he works with. Um, it also gives a sense of how, the, how a local regional company um, may have a more informal contract relationship, but again, all of the things that are discussed and are very, very similar between the different companies. Um, there's also a third case study that will be coming soon um, for West Coast Seeds, which is a BC-based, ecologically focused, um, more of a mid-size seed company. And they're very interested in increasing contracts with local growers. So their, their case study, um, again, gives the same kind of overview of how they develop relationships with their contract growers, what the requirements are and expectations, and then also some insights into which crops they see a, a gap in their current supply and where they see local growers um, filling a role in supplying that seed. So those, are, those case studies are available on the Contract Resources webpage, and the West Coast Seas one will be going there very soon. Um, one of the, the pieces that's in each of the case studies is a table like this um, that shows the management and quality assurance expectations. And so this gives you an outline of um, who is responsible for what and, and what is discussed. So this example with Turnacell is 
quite typical of a, a smaller regional seed company where they actually give a lot of guidance to their contract growers um, for isolation distances, population sizes, their, their um, recommendations for roguing, all of those things are guidance that the company will provide directly to the contract grower. For bigger seed companies, they expect the contract grower to be taking responsibility for this. And they're really looking more at what the quality of the seed is um, through looking at germination tests and purity testing. And they would expect the grower to be finding their own resources to ensure that they are following the best practices. Or if there is an agronomic challenge that arises during the growing season, that they find their own um, help to address those problems. But with the smaller seed companies, they, are, they really work closely with their growers to help them through these steps. Um, this also gives you a sense of the steps at the end of the process. So who is doing the germination tests? Um, what kind of testing is required? How will packing and shipping take place? And what certifications or growing practices might be required? So this is a table that's in each of the case studies and um, it gives a nice look at what the different spectrum of practices are. Um, but again, just reinforces that these are the basic things that in any contract relationship that you'd want to be discussing and making sure that you know um, who is responsible for which pieces and what the expectations are. Similarly, another resource that we have um, put on the website for contracts are two sample contracts. So these are coming from um, larger seed companies. But again, the contents of it um, are the same things that would be discussed even with a smaller regional company. For the smaller seed companies, usually their, their contract is more, more informal. Um, but you at least want to have something in writing, maybe just through email. But these are, reading through these contracts is really helpful to get a sense of what you should be, discuss, should be uh, discussing and agreeing upon before you get started in your contract relationship. So I'm just about to wrap up here, but I wanted to reinforce um, that there, there is a really strong opportunity um, and it, the opportunities really focus on the things that um, sea growers are already doing, doing well and, and increasing um, the trust in sea quality and focusing on offering high performing open pollinated varieties. This was repeated again and again and um, especially in certified organic seed, there is a lack of this seed available on the global market. So there is a real opportunity for, for local growers and Canadian seed growers to be filling this niche and increasing um, the commercial volume of seed available that, that, fits these, that fits these needs. So just as a quick recap, um, these are the resources that are now available on the website. Um, quality assurance and regulation, um, organic certification for seed producers, the three case studies I mentioned, sample contracts, as well as advice to get started that comes directly from seed growers. Um, so I'm going to take a break here for questions. And one thing that I didn't touch on so much um, in this presentation today, but I do have more information on if people are interested in, in it, um, is what contracting with a U.S. company would look like. So I did speak with High Mowing and Johnny's Organic Seeds. They both um, have interest in more certified organic, high performing open pollinated varieties. Um, Biennials is a gap for both of those, com for those companies. So there are some opportunities there as well. And um, because uh, one, of the, one of the companies in the case study is contracting to US, um, US companies now, we do also have more information around what that export process would look like. So if people have questions around that, that's something you can answer as well. Um, also, before we break to questions, I just also wanted to add that if there are C companies or um, other gaps of information that people have questions about, um, we can also add more resources to this. This is sort of the first, the first phase of what will likely be um, a longer, a longer process of developing resources to help support growers um, increase their commercial scale production by, by um, pursuing contract growing. So if there's companies that we haven't spoken with that you think would be a good fit, um, please 
bring it up now during the, the webinar questions, or there also will be a follow up survey. So you could give your suggestions there as well. So I think with that, um, we'll break now for questions. Okay, so Shauna, we do have a few questions coming up from people. Uh, the first one here from Caprin, uh, how hard is it to sell to the states? Yeah, yeah so it's actually not that difficult. Um, so Dan Brutois, for example, is one grower in Quebec who is already exporting to the US. Uh, he has a contract with one seed company there. And uh, for smaller vegetable seed lots, um, it's, it's not too arduous. Uh, you do need a phytosanitary cer certificate from the CFIA, but they have made the cost of that certificate very low. So it could be something in the range of $60. Um, a CFIA um, person would come to your farm, do an inspection and issue the phytosanitary certificate, and then you can ship the seed across. And in some cases, uh, the seed company that is purchasing the seed from you would actually pay for those shipping costs and the CFIA certificate. Okay, great. So another question here is asking about native plant seeds, so whether there is a need or demand uh, for plant seeds. And, and Karina is asking this in the context of keeping pollinators healthy. Uh, but what do you know about native plant seeds uh, in demand from seed companies? Yeah, so native plant seed is a great example of one of these underdeveloped niches. Um, so for example, uh, Wesco Seeds, their purchaser there, um, put a lot of emphasis around the need for more organic, um, certified organic flower and herb seed. And native seed would sort of fall in that same basket. Um, there is an interest in, in having that seed available and there isn't a lot of it uh, commercially available right now. There also are native seeds that are used in restoration, um, industrial restoration or uh, reforestry restoration. So there is a large market for that type of seed and there are not a lot of Canadian producers. So there are definitely, um, there's definitely a niche to be filled in, in that area as well. Okay, so another question, uh, a, a very broad one. How hard is it to get started if you were a new farmer and, and are there mentors to help newbies? That's a great question. Um, so we do have a mentorship program um, through the BCC Security Program. There also um, are other resources for for, in, for growing um, vegetable seeds at a commercial scale. Um, there's the COG course, the Canadian Organic Growers course. And so there, there are a lot of resources for getting started. I think also part of where the mentorship can come from is starting a relationship with one of the smaller regional seed companies. Um, for Dan Jason from Salt Spring Seeds, his rec, rec, one of his recommendations to new growers is to start a relationship with with one of your regional seed companies and continue to grow with them. So what that could look like is, you know, starting with um, one, of the, one of the easier to grow types of seeds, so peas and beans, which many seed companies, because it's such a, it needs, those crops need so much space, they sell out of that seed every year. So they need more growers to grow it. And it's, it's a very good entry level crop. So you could start by starting a relationship where you're growing um, those seeds for them and then they can help mentor you um, over time to advance your skill and as they get to know you better and trust your quality um, it's a great opportunity to to really grow together and so I think that was a great piece of advice from Dan Jason and so you can not just look for mentorship or training opportunities outside of seed companies but also the regional companies are really playing that role as well and and they want to play it. Okay, that was a great question. And here's another one from Rebecca. Uh, she's wanting to know if um, there's anybody, any folks growing seed only on contract as opposed to maybe small seed companies. Uh, is that something you've come across? Yes, so there aren't any Canadian examples that I know of, of organic focus or ecological focus growers that are just growing on contract. Um, but in the U.S. there is. So um, Chickadee Farm in Oregon, um, the grower there was actually, used to be a, a market vegetable grower and um, started growing seed. And then 
in the last couple of years has started to just grow exclusively um, on contracts. And he, I think he's doing about $100,000 of contract growing a year for C contracts and is trying to develop a business where, where it's purely focused on that. Um, I think in the long term, that is a strategy that, that could work. Um, also, I should mention the BC Eco C Co op locally. So it's a different model um, where it's a, it's a way for people to start growing seeds uh, at, a, at, a, at a higher volume without having to do their own packet sales. So this could be a way to um, advance your seed growing skills and, and see what it's like to grow seed um, on a larger volume without having to do um, 100 different kinds of seed. You could just focus on one or two crops and have the BC Eco Seed Co-op as one of, your, um, one of the places where you're selling seed to. Um, and you could also sell to other companies as well. Okay, so we have a few more minutes for questions if anybody has any more. Um, otherwise, we get the exhilarating experience of looking at a spreadsheet for the next half hour. Which I am very excited about myself. <laughs> so what we can do is, is we, can, we can start on uh, taking a look at the, uh, the enterprise budgets, the spreadsheet, and then what we can do is we can come back. If you have any questions for Shauna that come up, we're, we're happy to go back. We'll have, a, we'll have a question period at the end of the presentation here today as well. So over the past year, uh, we've been developing seed enterprise budget spreadsheets as a tool for farmers to better understand the input costs and revenue potential of seed crops. It's been identified that there are a lot of people interested in growing seeds, but uh, there's, there's a bit of a gap in, in knowledge in terms of what the economics of, of seed production looks like in terms of input costs uh, and what the potential revenue is. So building on models uh, developed by uh, Richard Wiswall and actually by Dan Breesbaugh as well, who's been mentioned already today, we've created a, a seed enterprise budget that we're, we're hoping farmers will use. Uh, and we've built it on the, the Google Docs platform. So it's an online version that will actually help us um, help you use the spreadsheet and we can do tutorials and help walk you through it. So that's what I'm going to cover today. Uh, we have done some testing of the, the seed enterprise budget spreadsheet already. The original version was tested at uh, UBC Farm with Mel Silvest, who's, who's joining us here today. And that was the first look at, how, you know, the way it's laid out. Does it make sense for farmers? Uh, does, does the layout make sense? Is everything there that needs to be there? So that was a, a very good start. And then just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I met with four different farmers to, to run through a few of their own seed crops to get a sense of, you know, how does this flow work for you? Where do you see things missing? So we've now got a fairly refined version of, of the spreadsheet, but it is going to go through a few more iterations as we, uh, as we develop it. So in looking at the, at the, uh, the spreadsheet, there's basically, uh, I break it down to three general things that an enterprise budget gives you. One is your input costs, so that's your labor and your materials. It also accounts for your overhead costs, um, as well as uh, the cost of structures. Then there's your potential yields and your potential revenue. And I put potential there because you may have a sense of what your uh, projected yields might be, but obviously there are many factors that can determine whether you achieve that yield or not. And the same thing with revenue. I like to call it potential revenue uh, because having the seed doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to sell the seed. And so the work we're doing with uh, this contract work and the uh, seed enterprise budgets is meant to complement our work that we're doing here in BC and nationally uh, to do more market development specifically around organic and um, organic vegetable seed. Come on, slide. Okay, there we go. So I just covered these, yeah. So let's, let's talk, we're gonna start with input costs here. So the first input cost I wanna talk about is overhead. And this is one that often gets left out when we're thinking about the, the value of a crop and the amount that goes into it. So overhead is, is all the fixed costs that go into your, uh, that go into your farm. So this might be your, your mortgage or rent, your electricity, insurance, your website, your phone. And, and it's important to include these. And the way the spreadsheet is designed is that once these are entered into the spreadsheet, the spreadsheet automatically spreads that cost evenly amongst the beds on your farm. So we'll take a look at that when we get to that. 
Uh, another big cost is obviously labor. Uh, it, it costs labor for maintaining the crops, doing your harvest and your processing. And the budget uh, spreadsheet is set up to give you different labor rates to account for your own and others' time. And then it's going to look at material inputs. So this is going to include, um, you know, seeds, compost, fertilizers, row covers, uh, machinery time as well. So uh, the way it's set up is a lot of these things are pre-labeled. So you can you kind of have some promptings there of the things that would happen. And then the fourth thing is structure costs. And, and the reason we have this in here is, is one of the projects we've done in BC over the past few years is, is growing uh, carrots in an isolation tent. So if you are using an isolation tent or a greenhouse as part of your seed production, then you'll want to include the structure uh, cost in that. And, and the, what the spreadsheet does is it, it allows you to amortize the cost of that, that structure over a certain period of time. So for example, a $10,000 greenhouse over 20 years gets amortized at about $500 a year. So these are just ways to make sure that all the costs, the actual costs that go into running your farm or producing your crop get accounted for when you're looking at the value of that crop. So yield is another thing that's, that's quite important. Uh, I, th I think in the beginning you can draw from some established um, um, databases to get a range of yields for, for certain crops. Uh, and what your yield determines is how much crop you have to sell. And obviously that, that's quite an important uh, thing to have. So uh, as part of the seed enterprise budgets, we actually do have a, a range of yields for many vegetable seed crops that you can use if you're, if you're very new at this. Um, but over time, hopefully you're tracking your own yield and your own uh, planting area. So you know what the expected yields on your farm are, or maybe you're working with other farmers so you know the expected yields in your region. And, and by using your own information, that's gonna make the, the model uh, much more accurate. Um, what, what I generally try to do is, is use yields on the low end, and that way if you produce a little bit more, it's just gonna improve your numbers. Uh, but try to keep your yield, um, um, estimates within a reasonable range for sure. And then projected revenues. Uh, I've always, uh, uh, revenues is interesting because, you know, it doesn't matter how much vegetables or seed or anything you produce, uh, if, you, if you're not able to get that to market. And I think we look at small scale farms, there's a very ready market for vegetables because basically everybody at some point consumes vegetables but your market for seed is a little smaller and it's basically your gardeners and your farmers. And there's a little more innuendo in terms of getting that seed to that market than there is getting it to, to a general consumer. So Shauna talked a little bit about this in terms of contracts. A part of this is building relationships over time, uh, which is gonna give you more secure contracts and, and more secure markets uh, for your seed. And when we're looking at the enterprise budgets, um, there's a couple of ways you can look at your potential markets. One is looking at where you would like to sell the seed and then putting in your numbers and that gives you a sense of how much work you're gonna to have to put in to sell that seed. And the other one is knowing where you already can sell that seed and putting the numbers in to get a sense of what you can expect to sell. And over time, hopefully your markets are more and more expected as you build those relationships. So one of the things that the enterprise budget does is, is allows you to calculate selling your seed to multiple markets at different price points. And then uh, it, it is uh, designed to, to show you the, the potential sale of all your seed crops. So kind of going back to Rebecca's question, the way that the enterprise budget is set up right now is more to accommodate growers who want to grow on contract and sell the seed to, to, to someone else, whether that's the co-op, another seed company, or even um, you know a larger seed company. Uh, this enterprise budget could be adjusted so you could put in all your own varieties of seed as a seed company, so you could have you know anywhere from 50 to 200 varieties listed in there, and it'll help you give the costs for, for all that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch over now to the enterprise budget uh, hosted in Google Docs and give you a chance to take a look at that. Uh, I'm not particularly enthusiastic about um, discussing, uh, having you all look at a, a spreadsheet for a, a great length of time, but hopefully just reviewing this um, helps make things uh, make a lot more sense. So as I mentioned before, the, the, the spreadsheet is hosted in Google Docs. If, if you're not familiar with using Google uh, in this way, uh, it, it's a platform where you can use, have documents, 
or um, or spreadsheets right in uh, right basically in the cloud. And the advantage of this is multiple people can be editing the document at the same time. And so this has been very useful. Uh, the growers I met with last week, I was able to sit down with them at home while they were at home. We, we, we all had our laptop open and this allowed them to us to go through things together. So when we were making changes and asking questions, we could make those changes in real time. So it's kind of what we're, we're looking at here is you can get a chance to take a look at, at what this looks like. So at the bottom here, there's a number of tabs, and these are just the different uh, portions of the spreadsheet. And I'm going to do a quick overview here uh, to give you a sense of, of what's involved. This first sheet here, the preparation checklist, is just sort of, uh, I would use this if I was going to do a consult with a grower, and it gives them a chance to start putting in some of their basic information, which we can later seed into the rest of the spreadsheet. Uh, you'll notice here, if you can see where, where my highlighted area is, uh, we have done a small, uh, a short tutorial video which covers this as well and goes into a little more detail than I'll go into today. It's about 13 minutes and it just goes to each of the tabs and talks about all the content there. So you can, you can take a look at this information uh, in the future. So the next tab is our details, um, just notes and more information about the beds. So what you're putting in here is, is your, basically your average bed length and your average bed width, as well as the area that you have under cultivation. And this is, uh, what, is what this is mainly going to do. It's going to help distribute those overhead costs uh, throughout your farm. So once you put this in, it's going to feed information that um, shows up later in, the, um, later in the spreadsheet. I'm seeing a lot of chat questions come up. Do we want to stop and answer some of those questions, or are we good to keep going? Okay, we're gonna keep going. I got the nod from Sean. Um, okay, so I'm gonna shift now over to the farm overhead worksheet. So this, this worksheet has a few components to it. Now at the top here is uh, where you can put in your wages. And for this one, I've put in two different wage levels, uh, somewhat arbitrarily, but some of the work we're gonna do here at Farm Folk City Folk this year, there'll just be probably two people working on it. Uh, and and what, what the spreadsheet does is it calculates the, the extra expenses you'll have, like EI and CPP you'll have to pay. It accounts for workers' compensation. And it also accounts for what we're calling non-assigned time. And this is the, the time you spend technically doing nothing between tasks. And that could be walking out to a field, that could be answering a text message, um, that could be just having a conversation. So even though you know, we might spend an hour doing a task, 10% of that time is actually doing other things around that task. So what it does, it just basically bumps up our, um, our rate there. The next section down below a little bit, these are your overhead costs I talked about. These are some estimates for a leased farm here in BC. Uh, and some of these numbers are somewhat made up, but also drawn from uh, real sources as well. Down below here in this next section is uh, what we've done is we separated the sort of office and management portions. So this is stuff that's important for your farm, but isn't actually in field production. And so we did this, these at three hours a week and one hour a week for, for maintenance. These are gonna vary between your different farms and we're finding this is between two and five hours depending on your farm. So you can see here in this calculation, we've got $20,000 in overhead costs. The, the calculation we used earlier gives us the number of beds on the farm. And so what it's done is it's spread these costs over your growing beds. And, and it also breaks it down between, you know, outdoor growing beds and anything in greenhouses. So your basic cost per greenhouse is $205, which could contain multiple beds, and this one is $34 for bed. So to put this in perspective, you know, before you even plant a crop in any of your growing beds, you, it's cost you $34. So that's just a, a very uh, <laughs> maybe critical way to look at it. So there's a cost in just having those beds there. The next tab here, uh, many of you wouldn't use this, and this is uh, if you're using a greenhouse or an isolation tent. And, and, and I've done this one, it's pre-filled for the isolation tents that we're using here for carrot seed production. So I've got all the different components entered there, and then you can see I've amortized those different components over different periods of time. And then what it basically does is gives, gives us a, um, a, an annual uh, a cost there. Uh, the wages we put in earlier are in there. Uh, because we're using smaller structures and they get moved on, on a year-to-year -year basis, we have to account for the time that goes into that, which is actually fairly significant. And so as, and as we go down, 
uh, as it is now, it's basically $415 for this structure. And that's if I'm allocating 100% of the structure for seed production, which is the case for, for these structures. If you are using a greenhouse where you, you are only using half of the greenhouse for half of the year, then you might set that number at, say, 25%. And that allows you to basically get a better understanding of what portion of that structure is going into um, seed production. So those are sort of the, the pre-tabs um, pre that, that we're, we're filling in. And these kind of are maybe done at once or once at the beginning of the season. The next section we go into is, is our crops. And, and this one, as I mentioned, is set up for six crops. So you can see we've got uh, the six crops labeled here in the tabs at the bottom. And I'm not going to go into detail in each of the crops. I'm just going to start with one of them and then just maybe talk about a few of the differences between these crops and, and what they look like. Um, the, the, it's good to name the crops down in the tabs. That makes it uh, easier to find them as well. So we're going to start with our, our Nash's Nance carrot. And this is a one that we grew last year in an enclosure. And we're also going to grow again this year in an enclosure and, and have some projected markets for the seed. So it's, it's a very realistic scenario based on both past and projected information. So section one here, which I'm highlighting, is, is our crop information. So this gives us our, 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 our crop and our variety name, our source and, and our planting date. You can see our wages show up there again to feed the spreadsheet. And then it's also got our, our planting area. So here we've actually got uh, 80 bed feet of this crop. Uh, I've got my spacing in there. And so what this does, it just gives us some uh, information on um, what our per row foot cost is gonna be, what our, uh, our per row uh, bed foot cost is gonna be. And it also accounts for roguing, roguing the crop out. So I also know what my likely final population is going to be. I've put in a projected seed yield here of 4,000 grams or four kilograms uh, based on past, um, past regional data that we've received from this. And that's a little lower than we uh, had achieved last year, but we also see some fluctuation in, um, in, in these yields. So section two in our production information, uh, this is set up for both biennial and uh, annual seed crops. As a biennial seed crop, carrot has one year of growing out the carrot, which goes into storage or stays in the ground over winter, and then the second year in which it goes into seed production. So typically this first section would be filled out with, with your first year production costs. Now in our case, we had another grower grow our stecklings for us, and so I'm just gonna skip to our second year, and you can just see here, our stecklings are just accounted for here as a material cost down in, in H74. So basically, we didn't have to grow the stecklings out in year one. We didn't incur a production cost for that. We just had a material cost for the stecklings. So what we have done here is we were, we've been able to uh, uh, record our, our input and uh, our hours and, and wages that go into the crop. And so this information is, is fed in here. I'm not going to go over it in detail. But as we scroll down, we can see in the, the lower uh, right-hand corner here, uh, kind of a summary of what our costs end up being. And so we're breaking our costs between our labor, our structure, and, and our materials here. And so for us to produce this cross, the co crop, it costs us about $1,000. And I'll point out here, you can see that the structure is a significant part of this, this uh, cost. So it, it is something that needs to be considered. So once all this information is, is put in, in terms of your input costs, what the spreadsheet does is it creates this crop report uh, down here on the left-hand side. And this gives a little bit of summary of the information you put in earlier, and it also gives you some, some data per bed foot, per plant, um, for, per plant after, after roguing, and gives us a, a cost per gram, um, uh, per gram of yield as well. So this gives us some comparative information that we can use on a year-to-year -year basis if we're sowing you know, 80 row feet or 80 bed feet one year and then 200 bed feet the next year. This is really useful com for comparisons. On the right, we've got some income estimators. And, and what this does is basically gives us a sense of, uh, if we're harvesting different amounts and selling them at different prices, what our potential revenue is and what our potential profit is. And what I generally do is I put our expected yield in this middle section here, and I go a little below and a little above. And you can see what that does is, is you can see where it's in red, where our values are a little bit in a, in a bit of a loss. 
And so right here, you can sort of see between the three and five kilogram range, where depending on your price and your yield, uh, that's going to determine whether or not you're making money uh, on this crop. Now I'm going to go over to the right a little bit here to, to answer a, a, a question that came up earlier. And that is what is our, our per acre return on these crops? And so you can see if we were to, to expand this into a per acre uh, basis, what the value of these crops is at this volume at this price. Now a caveat here is if you were growing an acre of this crop, you would not be able to get this, this pricing. And so if you're growing larger volumes, you're going to have to change your, your, your seeding price. And so your, 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 um, your price per kilogram. So this, if you were to take the, the smaller amount, which we're going to sell to smaller seed companies that generally can pay a higher price, even though this gives us a, a per acre value, um, as your volume of production goes up, your per acre uh, return is going to go down. I won't go into too much of that detail here, um, but uh, keep that in mind. So I'm going to scroll down to the next section there here, um, which is getting to our sales projections. So as I mentioned earlier, it, it doesn't matter how much seed you grow if you can't sell it. And if you think you can sell it, um, then it's good to know how much you can sell and who you can sell that to. So this is in a few different parts. Um, one thing I do is I list who, what our sales channels here are, who the different people are that we can sell to. Uh, and this auto feeds other things in the in the spreadsheet and then we've also got things broken down by size and by price and this is going to vary depending on your crop but I've put in numbers here based on uh, the channels that we're planning on selling to or hoping to sell to uh, which in our case is the BC Eco Seed Co-op and Salt Spring Seeds uh, here in BC and we're hoping to sell some of our, our biennials which are a little harder to grow out east to, to Ferrum Turnasol. So our yield from above is feeded in here below. And what I've done is I've just basically gone through and entered how much I think uh, I, I can sell to each of these um, markets. So I think I can sell about 60 and 50 small packs to the BC Eco Seed Co-op and Salt Spring Seeds. You know, some of the bigger bulk ones here uh, for the BC Eco Seed Co-op are listed. And then you can see over here, I'm hoping to sell three kilograms of the seed to, uh, to Ferrum Turnasol. So what it's done is it's given me a, a bit of a sense of, okay, if I'm growing this much seed and I think these are the markets that I can sell to, what is that going to look like? So if I come down to the bottom here, um, well, there's two parts to look at. So what it does is it, it breaks down my total sales there. So at this I can sell, I'm selling about $1,063 of this crop. And then I go down and it's, it's showing my expenses there. We calculated earlier. So according to this, if, if I sell everything according to this, I'm going to profit $60. Now, that might seem like a low profit, but when we look at profit within this spreadsheet, this is the profit to the farm. And so what this means is all the overhead for the farm has been covered. Everybody has been paid, including you as the, as the farmer, and your staff has been paid. So this is, means all your costs are covered and the farm is making money here. The other important thing to look at here is we still have seed remaining. And so uh, we've got 15% of our seed remaining, about 610 grams. And so this gives me a sense of whether or not I'm growing the right amount of seed for how much I want to sell. Now this is a crop that I want to sell in one year. I can see I can sell most of this in one year. And so what I might do is, is, even though these are my projections, I might try to do a bit more marketing to, to push some of these bulk sales or get a little more of these packet sales to, to the co-op and to Salt Spring Seeds. And I do want to have a little bit of the seed left over so I have uh, the seed for my own sowing use next year. And then if we look down below, there's just some summary stuff here. Uh, the spreadsheet, because we're putting in so much data, there's lots of points at which it just summarizes things. So how, how you want to use that information is up to you. A lot of it is optional, but um, it's there if you need it. And you can create your own calculations from this as well. So different crops are going to look a little bit differently. And I'm not going to go over this detail in all the crops, but I'm just going to go to a few of the other ones and just show it, make a few points here. So as I shift over to the carrots and look at the rumba, I'm just going to go down to our sales projections here. And, and look at, you know, if I do the same amount of sales for this rumba, which I'm actually growing outdoors and not in an enclosure, I actually profit $467.
instead of the instead of the sixty dollars we made on the other enclosure. So we can see that growing something with an enclosure really really brings down the the return the net profit of that crop. However, the advantage of that is, is I'm actually going to grow these two crops side by side, which you couldn't do. So even though there's some limiting in the cost of one, I do still profit on it, and I am off, able to offer two varieties uh, for sale in, in the same year. So that gives me an advantage. Uh, you know, as a note, if this is what I think, um, if this is what I think I can sell in one year, and I know I can produce more, what I might do is is produce three three times as much of the seed, and that way I potentially have seed to sell over the next three years. And we can see that with some of the other ones here as we get into them here. So if we look at the radish seed here, which is our next tab. This is a French breakfast. You know, when I look at the amount I was able to sell in small units here, I think I can sell two batches of smaller seeds at 50, some bulk stuff, uh, slightly bigger, but I don't have a, a bulk amount here that I'm going to sell to Ferrum Turnasol. And so in the end, you know, in, in this year, we've got $307 in sales, which means in this year, I, I technically have a loss. I haven't made any money on this crop. However, I still have 81% of this seed left over. And so what I can do is I can continue to sell this seed for the next, you know, technically five years, but ideally I'd want to sell just a little more this year and try to space this seed over about three years, which is fairly common for contract growers to, to, to uh, sell multiple years worth of seed to a seed company. Uh, it does involve uh, doing germination testing on a year to year basis. But uh, in, in subsequent years, um, I'll be able to generate this revenue, but I obviously won't have those expenses of, of producing the seed. Shifting over to the touchstone gold, um, same thing here. So I was able to produce $992. This involves selling some small packets and then once again here going to uh, Ferrum Turnasol uh, a few kilograms in bulk. And this is an interesting one where we're able to make about $100 and selling just a little bit over half of the seed. And so same thing here is I might actually want to bring my sales down a little bit in this year so I can space these sales out over two years. Uh, and, and if I'm making um, you know, $990 in sales this year and getting close to that next year, once again, I won't have this $890 in expenses to carry over. Uh, I'll quickly scroll up on this one. So this is a biennial crop and you can see on this one I did fill in the first year production. We're going to grow our own stecklings for this crop so I just filled that information in. So you can see in the first year it cost me about $303 to produce the crop and in the second year it cost about it cost $587 to get that $890 value. And then so a similar thing with Lacinato kale here. So this is one where, you know, you can kind of see if we did our projected markets with a little bit of bulk sales, we do $623 in sales, we're losing a bit of money on that in year one, and we're selling about three quarters of the crop. So this is one I probably want to bump the sales up a little bit in year one, because I've probably just produced a, about a year's worth of seed, and then I've got, you know, definitely seeds left over to use on farm, and then we try to bump up these sales here. And we've got some edamame in here. This one is this one is courtesy of Mel Sylvester at, at UBC Farm. Just coming down here. This is an annual crop here. So this one, you know, we sold, uh, you know, projecting about seven hundred and twenty dollars in sales. You can see in this one, I actually bumped up the the, the units for BC Eco Seed Co-op. Uh, I recall Mel saying it's a very good selling crop, and so I'm bumping my projections up there a little bit. And so with these numbers, we're doing $720 in sales. We're making a profit on that. And we actually have enough for a second year of sales there as well with some leftover. So this, is, this seems like a fairly, fairly valuable crop um, within that area. So what we've done is we've, we've kind of, you know, gone over six seed crops there, which if I'm growing seed on contract at, at a bigger scale and maybe even bigger than this, that, that allows me to focus on those crops without doing 50 to 100 crops of my own seed company and do larger volumes. So the next tab here, what it does is it breaks things down uh, and it does a summary of everything. And so what it does is it allows me to break it down by the sizes here. So we know uh, how much and how many units and how much value we had in each size. And on the left here, we've got it broken down by our markets as well. So we know how much we sold to, to, to each market. 
And just as a general summary, so this would be my projected seed sales for 2018, and this would be my projected expenses to produce that seed. So in 2018, I, I would technically make a profit if I was to sell all that seed as, as expected. And then just keeping in mind that I know I have a bunch of that seed left to do multiple years of sales. Um, so I'm going to generate more revenue from that, which isn't really accounted for here. Uh, we're trying to keep this spreadsheet, <laughs> believe it or not, a little more at the basic level. Um, and then just on, if you scroll over to the right here, just a, f a few graphs to show you how that seed uh, gets distributed in terms of by markets, uh, by units, and by size. So just a, a quick visual there. So the, the remaining of the tabs here are, are, often, are mostly just reference tabs. I'm just gonna review those really, really quickly. Um, if you're doing uh, stuff in greenhouses uh, in terms of doing transplants, this gives you a sense of the cost that goes into producing a, a, a flat worth of kale seed. So it includes your flats, it includes your soil, it includes your labor. And this is for, uh, you can change these values to get a sense of, you know, if people fill flats faster or slower on your farm, you can adjust these numbers to account for your, uh, your own farm. This is a chart of, of yield guidelines for different crops. So it gives us a yield per acre, a yield per thousand square feet, and then at the end, a projected yield per, per hundred row feet. So uh, it gives you just at least a bit of a guideline for some of these crops to work with. Uh, here are the row and plant spacing calculator. This is quite useful if you want to get a more exact uh, cost of, of your price of seeding. So when I did the, the beet calculation, you know, I might have to buy uh, you know, $70 worth of seed in order to get enough seed to, to, to do the planting, but I might actually use only about $60 worth of that seed for the planting itself. So this just helps me uh, do that calculation here. I won't go into detail on that one. And then there's a few uh, spreadsheets at the end, which uh, I'm hoping over time will get sort of crowdsourced. And this is going to help people get a sense of what is pricing and what is sizing look for different crops, look like for different crops. And here's a few that I filled in for carrots and, and, and watermelon. And so if, I, if I'm growing these crops for the first time, ideally we'd have a fairly detailed database here. Uh, and that's going to help you get a sense of setting your pricing and your sizes for that specific crop. And then the same thing here uh, for creating examples in uh, what your labor costs are. I think tracking your labor for everything you do all the time is, is quite difficult. And so when it comes to filling out the, the enterprise budget uh, very, uh, precisely, it's going to be hard to know exactly how much weeding time and, and planting time you spent. But with a bit of a database here, and you know, if you know that you know, how much time on average it takes to do a 150 foot bed in weeding or sowing or anything else, you can plant those numbers in. And once again, this is a model. And so a model is meant to give you a fairly good estimate of what your costs and, and revenue can be, but it doesn't need to be precise. So you can decide how precise you want your model to be um, while you're using it. So now that I have spent the last half hour or so uh, boring you with a, with a spreadsheet, um, I'm happy to open it up to questions. I'm going to go back to um, just one of the seed crop ones. This generally is war, where more of the questions are. And one thing I didn't cover on here is, is the types of cells that we use. Um, so one is you can see all the green, these ones in green. So green cells are the ones where you can enter information. This is the stuff you need to input in terms of your yield data, your, your beds and everything like that. The yellowy orange cells here are the ones where the calculations take place. And so these are ones where you, you should not edit them basically. They, they uh, denote a calculation. And, and changing that, uh, you can change it if you're, you're comfortable doing that. But changing it in one portion might affect the spreadsheet in other parts. So just be mindful if you want to make those changes. Um, but they are open to be edited uh, in, in any way you feel um, necessary. So, um, so a few key points here, I think. Um, Number one is, is knowing like the better you track your inputs, the more accuracy you're going to get. So if you know your farm very well, that's uh, very helpful. Um, the spreadsheet is set up to sell to multiple sources and, and as a, uh, you know, in essence, supporting the principle of diversity, the more sources you can sell to, the more resilient your seed production is going to be. It's going to give you much more options, especially if, um, 
especially if one of your markets happens to fall through, you might be able to pick up how much is going to another one. I do recommend estimating your yields on a low but reasonable end, just to make sure you're not overestimating what your potential could be. And over time, trying to shift to use your own yield data. So for, the, for these, some of these, I was able to plug in our own data that we've had from for a few years, and other, others are estimates based on uh, existing databases and you know, what it might be like in this climate. Uh, and last but not least is, is those overhead costs are important. Uh, they can get overlooked when we start focusing more on inputs and labor. Uh, but you could see at $38 per bed um, for, in this case, per 100 foot bed, you know, if you're growing 400 row feet of some, or bed feet of something, you've got $120 in costs there that you might not be thinking of. So uh, as you fill these out for your own farm in the future, uh, make sure you're putting in as much of that overhead cost as possible uh, to make sure that your, your numbers are as accurate as they can be. So <laughs> I'm going to leave that open to questions there. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, in the chat box, you've received lots of accolades for your great work on the spreadsheets and many requests for receiving the editable version of the spreadsheets. So we will send that out to everybody in a link um, following the webinar. The version online is just view only so that it isn't uh, changed inadvertently. So we'll get everyone the edible version. And if people have questions uh, for Chris, um, you can either type them into the type box or you can raise your hand and you can ask the question directly. Okay, well, I guess the spreadsheets were <laughs> so overwhelming that um, it's hard to ask specific questions without really digging into it, which is fine. Um, yeah, you're right, Rebecca. I think questions may come as we work with it. So um, we'll also share, of course, Chris's email so you can follow up with specific questions. Um, and I think one thing that Chris didn't mention that part of the work around this is to, to actually collect more numbers on what are the yields? What are the economic returns? What are the production costs for seed? Um, if anyone's ever tried to look for that information, you probably realize quite quickly that it's really, really hard to find hard numbers around seed production costs and even seed yields. So part of the idea of making these spreadsheets available and then creating them is to help us um, figure out like what are the real costs in seed production and, and what, what are the variables? So um, part of this project is to, um, to do these real-life real uh, spreadsheets with farmers and then to make um, sample ones available so that people that are new to seed growing can get a sense of what the comparative cost might be um, for different production systems and, and different seed crops and then also be able to edit them for your own use. And um, the Seed Enterprise Budget Leak has gone out now, so you can check it out. And then you can copy and paste it and use it for your own use for your farm. But you can still bug Chris with any questions you have while you're going through. One of the, um, as, as part of our work here in BC, one of the things we're, we're really hoping to do with this tool is actually be able to walk through, through this with farmers one-on-one. -on -one. I think what often happens is these tools get released to farmers. You know, you, you attend a webinar like this and then it's basically, you know, go use that tool. And, and I think realistically that can often be very difficult. And, and a couple of weeks ago when I sat through and did this with, with farmers, uh, going through it together allowed them to get much more done very quickly. And I don't think anybody has, has followed up and gone back to it. But our goal would be to do, uh, you know, basically three to six hours of consults with people to make sure that they're using the, the, the enterprise budget, that it's accurate, and that they, once they've gone through it and, and with a consultant, basically, they, they, they have a good enough grip of it that they can update it on their own in the future. So it's, it's not only our goal to make the tool available for growers, uh, but also to help gr growers navigate it and work through it. So we'll keep you posted on, on how that goes, which is, of course, uh, funding dependent. So it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Uh, it, 
I'm exhausted after going through that. So I can't imagine what you people are experiencing on the other end. Um, but uh, I, what I do want to do, uh, do is address our, our, our funders here. Uh, so much of the work we do uh, is only able to happen because we have such great supporters across the country. Uh, obviously, through the, the Bouda, uh, Bouda Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security and the Weston Foundation, a big a core part of our funding uh, comes from them, and we're very grateful for that. Here in BC, Van City gave us some additional funding to do this contract work, uh, as well as the seed enterprise budgets. And then, uh, Sean, I mentioned the BC seed trials earlier, which we have three years of funding through the Investment Agriculture Foundation, which has been crucial in, in seeing that project be successful. And we've been able to build on that project to do this, this kind of work. And, uh, and through the future, we're looking at, at more funders to help us continue this work so we can build on, on the great work we've done by working with farmers across BC and across Canada and to lay the foundation for future work as well. Uh, the, uh, as a movement, there, there's more and more uh, questions and ideas that come up. And uh, yeah, we're, we're really excited about um, keeping this going. I am seeing some questions come up there. So uh, we could, could do some more if people still have some time or you're welcome to, uh, to, to, to log off it and get out into the field, as I know it's a little bit later out east right now. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we'll get this uh, edited and online as soon as we can. Uh, so that way you can share, you've, you've got it to see again, you can uh, share it with others. And thanks again for, for joining us and for your great questions. And we look forward to working with many of you again in the future.